Hello and welcome back. Today I'm going to start by discussing the genetic significance of sexual reproduction. Two biological parents, your mother and your father, each contributed half of their DNA to produce you or any offspring. You probably noticed, unless you're an identical twin, that you don't look exactly the same as your siblings or your parents. So what sexual reproduction does is it gives rise to variation. With all that variation, we have successes and failures. Sexual reproduction is what allows us to have two sets of homologous chromosomes, one set again from your mother and one set from your father. So you have 46 total chromosomes. Another, another way of saying that would be 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. Alleles are different versions of the same gene, and when we look at your chromosomes, you have multiple alleles for different genes. You have at least two alleles for every gene. An example would be you have one allele for blood type from your mother and another allele for blood type from your dad. You have two versions because, again, you have one from your mother and one from your father. And these genes are located at very specific locations on each chromosome. And those specific locations on the chromosome are referred to as loci. These loci, or the location of the genes on the chromosome, are important because DNA is associated with other sequences which control and regulate gene expression, such as promoters or enhancers. When we consider the different forms of the genes, you may ask yourself, where did these alleles come from? Those alleles, many of them actually arose through mutation. Remember, alleles are different versions of the same gene. Eukaryotes like us have multiple alleles from many of our genes. I gave you the example of blood type, but look at the variation in humans. Take eye color, for example. There are many alleles for eye color. Different alleles can be beneficial, they can be harmful, and they can be neutral. But when it comes to eye color, there's no real advantage having brown eyes, blue eyes versus hazel eyes or green eyes. That makes this allele mostly neutral. There are different versions of alleles, but they don't seem to give any major advantage for natural selection. Even if you have a preference for eye color, would you choose a partner solely based on his or her eye color? So some of the definitions I want to recap before moving on. Alleles. That's a variation or a different version of a gene. Phenotype is the physical characteristic that you see when a gene is being expressed. The genotype is your genetic makeup. And to summarize again, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. These chromosomes are numbered 1 through 22 and sex chromosomes named X and Y. You have a pair of each chromosome, 1 through 22, one from your mom and one from your dad, and you have two sex chromosomes. You're either XX, which makes you female, or XY, which makes you male. And each matching pair of chromosomes are called homologous. Now, two new terms I want to introduce. Homozygous, not to be confused with homologous, and heterozygous. Homozygous means you have two identical alleles for a specific gene. And heterozygous means you have non-identical alleles or two different versions of the allele. So when we look at these different alleles, we see that they can interact with each other, and some alleles will act in a dominant fashion and others are recessive. Dominant means that that allele is present. When it's present, the phenotype will be observed. It masks or blocks the recessive allele. And a recessive allele is only seen when a dominant allele is not present. And a good way to discuss this is with the dominant disease called human polydactyly. In the case of human polydactyly, a person who has this gene can express extra fingers. But what we see is that there's incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity. Penetrance is if you see the phenotype when a person has a particular genotype. Up until now, we've assumed if you had a genotype, you'd express the phenotype. But in some cases, there can be incomplete penetrance. Some people who had the genotype for polydactyly actually show normal hand with no extra fingers. Also, we see something called variable expressivity, which means that you may have penetrance of this gene, but it can be expressed to different degrees. Where some people may have a complete extra finger form on their hand, others just have a partial finger. So there's a higher degree of expressivity in some people with the entire extra finger versus others. So the two terms again were penetrance and expressivity. Penetrance refers to whether or not you're expressing the genotype. Yes, you have the extra finger, or no, you don't. Variable expressivity is the degree to which you're expressing that specific genotype. So you can see why simply stating one gene will result in one specific phenotype is rare. Additionally, phenotypes can be influenced by environment. So let's think of one example. Blood type, for instance. When we look at your blood type, it's solely determined by your genes. So if you're A positive blood type or B negative or O negative, that's determined by your genes. But your environment really doesn't impact that blood type. 
But what about how much blood, how many red blood cells, or how much hemoglobin you're synthesizing? Well, that's determined by your environment. Say you want to go on vacation to Machu Picchu, up, it's in a high altitude to see the Incan ruins. Well, your body needs to adapt. You're going to secrete hormones that tell your body to make more hemoglobin and more red blood cells. After a couple of days, you'll have more red blood cells because you're adapting to the environment. So you can see in this example how a change in the environment influenced gene expression. So does one gene just control one phenotype? Well, we're going to go back to one of the first examples we talked about, the sickle cell trait. And what we see in the case here is pleiotropy. This is the impact that one gene can have on multiple characteristics. The mutation in the DNA sequence that caused a mutated hemoglobin to be produced changes the function and ultimately changes the shape of the erythrocyte or red blood cell. But there are actually multiple manifestations or phenotypes due to this gene mutation, where you can see physical weakness in people, anemia. Also, you can see some protection from being infected by the parasite that causes malaria. So one mutation in one gene actually causes multiple physical manifestations. There are also examples where multiple genes influence a single phenotype. This is called polygenic. A great example of this would be skin color. When you look at your skin color, that's not simply a dominant or recessive one gene, one phenotype interaction. There's actually over a dozen genes involved in determining one physical trait, which is your skin color. And the last type of gene interaction we're going to talk about is epistasis. And that's where one gene product masks, masks the expression of another gene. So gene products can interact with each other, and you can get phenotypes that aren't necessarily what you would expect with one specific genotype. So imagine a mouse with a mutation. And that mutation forms an eyeless mouse. So this mouse is born with no eyes. Well, that's going to mask the gene for eye color. So you have one phenotype and one product that has been influenced by the expression or observance of another physical trait. An eyeless mouse, you're not going to know what the genes were for eye color. In our next lecture, I'll discuss how hormones can affect gene expression. See you soon.